now it works. Thank you so much for the technical assistance. Um, thank you this, for being here this evening. Um, this meeting is now called to order. We have a quorum and presence. Uh, to, first, we have to start off with the Pledge of Allegiance, and I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Chris Henson to please do the Pledge of Allegiance for us. Thank you. You'll stand, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Mr. Henson, for stepping in on behalf of our student board members. Um, before we can do the adoption of the agenda, I do need to ask for that motion to be um, amended. So usually we would just adopt it as stated, but I need us to flip public participation in the director's report. So director's report would come before public participation. So That's what we have historically done, um, but it was just typed out incorrectly. So just in case people are waiting for that, you're working through traffic, they believe they have that extra time to get here. I don't want it to switch up on them. So, may I have a motion to switch public participation in the director's report uh, on this agenda? So moved. All right. Do I have a second? Second. Second. Thanks. All those in approval of those changes. All right. It is unanimous. Thank you so much. All right. So, that gets us to the director's report. So, I will hand it over to Dr. Battle. Thank you so much, Chair Rod. Um, good evening, board members. It's great to be back with you as we get ready to kick off the start of a new school year. So first off, I want to shout out once again our students, our teachers, staff, and families for all of their hard work. Last year, they paid off with TCAP results showing we outpaced the state of Tennessee in terms of growth in nearly all categories. And we had the highest ELA achievement score since the new standards were implemented in 2017. Additionally, we are confident we'll meet the participation rate in all subject areas once the state confirms our numbers, and we're pleased to see growth in integrated math one, two, and three despite increased participation rates along with English two and biology. Of course, we still have a lot of room for growth to be where we want to be in terms of overall achievement and reducing gaps, but this is a strong foundation to build on moving into the upcoming school year. While none of us were fans of the third grade retention law, we knew going into last school year that it would be a priority to ensure that we prepared parents and gave our students every possible chance to be promoted to the fourth grade along with their peers. Because of this intentional effort combined with our previous work in building up the Promising Scholars Program to be open to all students, to date only 1.4% of third grade students from our district run schools will, will repeat the third grade. Roughly 20% will require tutoring this fall and our principals are working with district leadership to plan and prepare for making sure all students who need this intervention for promotion will have it available to them. Now, we do expect that number of retained students to go up a bit when we include in charter schools, but we didn't have all their data available by today to give an accurate picture of the combined total. I really appreciate the hard work of all of our staff, our students, and our families. This has been an incredibly stressful experience, particularly for some of our students. But we have made it through and look forward to repeating this success next school year. And we've got some great new principal leaders to celebrate for the upcoming school year. In the elementary space, we have Dr. Lauren Hurley Wilson leading Andrew Jackson Elementary, Camilla Matthews at AZ Kelly, Amanda Keeley at Jolton Elementary, Nia Perry at Mountain View Elementary, Raquel Gonzalez at Pennington Elementary, Shelly Robinson, who is uh, moving over to Tom Joy Elementary. Matthew Earls leading Tusculum Elementary Schools, and Janelle Brooks leading Warner Elementary. In the middle school space, we have Dr. Ashley Roby, who is leading East Magnet Middle, Dr. Tanya T Dennis leading Haynes Middle School, 
Dr. Dinethea Williams leading JFK Middle School, and Dr. Nashara Neal leading Meg's Magnet School. And last but not least, we have some new high and optional school principals that we're so excited who will be leading um, from their seats. Clarissa Zellers uh, will be moving over to the Academy at O'Cockrell. Nikisha Burnett will be leading Antioch High School. Dr. Deontay Alexander will be leading Cane Ridge High School. Bruce Jackson will be leading McGavick High School. Dr. Brenda Diaz will be leading the MMPS Virtual School as well as Big Picture High School. And Dr. Kelby Garner will be leading Overton High School. So we're extremely proud um, of our new leaders stepping into their new roles and who are preparing for an excellent start of the school year. Summer professional learning for MMPS staff kicked off on May 30th, 2023. This summer, teachers, support staff, and school leaders could attend 180 unique professional development opportunities with over 425 sessions and approximately 9,200 seats available for, each, for these sessions. This year, all mathematics teachers and other staff that directly support numeracy instruction, like instructional coaches, English learners, and exceptional education teachers in grades K through 12 will participate in professional learning around the recently adopted mathematics curriculum in support of our numeracy-focused outcome. Additionally, principal identified staff members at elementary schools will complete computer science integration professional development this summer in support of the focus on computer science standards. Our literacy focused outcomes will continue to be supported through summer professional development around the district's adopted literacy curriculums. To further support MMPS's commitment to social emotional learning and equity, unique offerings such as the MMPS SEL conference and sessions focused on culturally relevant pedagogy are also available for educators to deepen the knowledge and skills they acquired during pre professional development last summer. Additionally, teachers and support staff that directly impact student instruction are provided the opportunity to be compensated for up to five days of instructional planning through a focus on unit internalization, student work, and data analysis, and lesson preparation. Through Principal Landing and Launch, MMPS executive principals reflect on successes and opportunities for growth from the 22-23 school year around the implementation of instructional leadership teams, continuous improvement cycles, leadership visibility, collaborative planning structures, and cycles of professional learning using structured analysis and reflection protocols. These reflections will be used to develop theories of action and SMART goals that will serve as a catalyst for the 23-24 continuous improvement efforts. Now on this slide here you see just a few examples of some of the summer professional development that was offered to teachers and staff this summer. But the learning isn't done. Next week we'll have more than 6,000 staff participating in annual district-wide in-service sessions across 17 locations throughout Nashville. In addition to covering normal content areas, MMPD will also be offering craze training for our school staff so they can be refreshed and prepared on school safety procedures going into the start of the school year. We also had our Music City SEL Level Up Conference this year in partnership with Alignment Nashville, which saw more than triple the attendance from last year, with 385 educators and others participating. I enjoyed moderating a panel discussion with several of our team members and our outgoing student board member, Ebenezer Hale. They all had great insights about SEL work and how much it informs what we do in schools every day. This was a great opportunity to reiterate and reinforce how central social emotional learning is to everything we do as a district. SEL is not an add-on or a luxury. It is integrated with academic learning and is critical to our work to prepare students for success in college, career, and life. I appreciate everyone from Chief Springer's team and our partners at Alignment and STARS for all the hard work that went into making this conference happen. And thanks to all the members of Team MMPS who took time to participate. And finally, on Monday, next Monday, y'all, we'll be welcoming our 10-month teachers back and ending the day with our third annual Together for Teachers pep rally held at First Horizon Park. 
This is an event that Pencil puts on for teachers in coordination with MMPS, and we're looking forward to a great celebration to start the school year off right. So with that, Chair Elrod, I will turn the mic back over to you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much. Do we have any questions about this information? All right, we have a comment from Vice Chair Player. Um, I just want to comment, particularly on the TCAP um, results, um, just given um, some of the narrative that's been going on with the current uh, elections, um, I would like to make a note, I know we are not in a perfect place, but we're in a good place, and as uh, people make their decisions, but more importantly, as leaders, we really do our homework about what the successes we have had um, with our board, with our director of schools, um, with the growth of progress that we have been achieving, and that, um, that we do our research and that we are attentive to what we are doing as a board, as leaders, of how we are educating our children. We take this job seriously. We do not take it lightly. We take the responsibility very seriously. And we do really put all of our heart and energy into this. And to show that uh, we have been making successes. We have had innovative leadership into this place and we continue to grow. And so as we go into the next couple of weeks making very crucial decisions about our next leaders, of our um, of our government and the relationship with the board that is very pertinent that we are making progress we are doing better than our state counterparts um, or other sister schools sister districts counterparts and meeting the standards that are set by the state time and time again even though the impediments have been put from us um, and the impediments is not always due to our lack of leadership um, and so I think that's just really important that we highlight as we go into these conversations have these conversations about education as a collective as in Davidson County that we are doing good things we are making improvement we are having successes and that the numbers speak for themselves we are a data-driven board we we always joke we geek out on data <laughs> we've had some data-driven debate um, no matter where we were on which side of the debate we are they were based on data not just a feeling not just a perception not a just on a idea but we really try to anchor our improvements um, our successes, our methods, our methodology, our pedagogy, all on data. Um, and I just really want to put this that on the record and bring forward of um, the successes that we have and the successes we continue to have. And that's our goal is to educate our children. That is not about political motives, um, political intentions, but our sole job and our fiduciary responsibility is to educate our children and to celebrate the successes and talk about our successes and really talk about successes and really advertise our successes, that only 1% is being retained, given the narrative that is out there, we are educating our children. And so I just want to put that on the record. Anyone else? Okay. Ms. Bugs. Thank you, Chair, Chair, Chair Elrod. Dr. Battle, is there still a need, considering that those third graders who completed the school year, went to Promising Scholars, now have to complete a full year in fourth grade of tutoring and pass TCAP or make adequate growth, is there still a need for volunteers from the community? Because what I'm trying to make sure the parents understand is that even if their child completed Promising Scholars, that they're still not, out, still not in the clear unless they pass that fourth grade um, 10, 10 ready tests or they may you know face retention next year so I just want to make sure that we're putting as much information into the community and rallying the community as best as possible to support all of our students so I'll answer the first part of the question as um, Chief Brace did and comes up to the podium um, the answer is yes um, we will continue to advocate for tutors to join our um, accelerating scholars um, program to provide those tutoring um, options for our students it is a requirement um, for um, I think it's about 20 percent of our students to be engaged with tutoring this upcoming school year and so um, in any way that we can expand our ability to capture um, the students that are impacted by the retention law but other students who are still in need of tutoring we want to make sure that that's available for them 
Chief uh, yeah, just picking back on that, if anyone wants to volunteer or learn more, you can go to acceleratingscholars.org, and there's some information there to provide you, and you can sign up to just get more information and tutor uh, a few times a week. It's a really great opportunity. Everyone that has participated has really enjoyed the experience. Um, and just to also note that most of the tutoring that we have provided so far and will provide is actually teacher instructional based and small group tutoring, but we do, uh, it's really a strong opportunity, especially for those outside of the uh, third or fourth grade that may still need those tutoring opportunities to have that community volunteer uh, support as well. Thank you for that. I think I'm just trying to help to paint the picture that we have 20% of our fourth graders who have to have that three hours a week of intensive one-on-one -on -one tutoring. But we also have students, like I was tutoring a student in middle school, who are still opting for tutoring. And that's, I don't think we really understand how many thousands of students that ends up being and how many at least hundreds of, of tutors we need. So I would appreciate anyone that can hear this to just kind of share that message. And if you know some teacher prep students, retirees, or just anyone in the community that is open to offering that. It's about 30 minutes uh, a day, three three, three days a week, but it, it's, it, it really is an investment in our students that they need. So thank you for that. 30 minutes, three times a week, or twice a week, 45 minutes. And to, oh, yep, go ahead. I'm yeah. sorry, to add on, I just want to say that that tutoring is available both virtually and in person. So there's flexibility as well um, for our volunteers to get involved um, so that we make it possible. And then lastly, you are trained. Um, that is often a question of maybe I want to do it, but I don't feel like I'm able or, you know, not comfortable with this. I'm not actually a teacher. We go through training um, with that with you as well. So I um, want to make sure that there's not anybody that feels like they could do it. They just don't have the how. Okay. All right. See, there's no further no, question. No, oh, no, no. sorry, Dr. Gentry. I don't have a question, but I do not want to just gloss over the new principal appointments. <laughs> okay. I know that the third grade uh, retention has been definitely heavy on everybody's mind, um, but I just want to thank Dr. Battle for her thoughtfulness and her, um, I think, making some, maybe some surprising moves to some people, but just making the decisions to do what's best for our students um, and giving some of our up and coming leaders an opportunity um, to, to sit in the, in the big chair um, and lead in a way that they've been trained to lead. Uh, through their experiences here within MMPS and their mentorship that they've received from their, uh, their principals and from our leadership here at the district. I know I'm super excited uh, about our principal placements in District 1 at Jolton and at Haynes, and so I thank you for that. I look forward to meeting those new leaders um, and helping to move the needle for our students. Thank you. And if you don't mind me adding, um, um, Celia Jolly, new principal at Croft Middle School as well, and we also have two fabulous interim principals at Two Rivers and at Hull Jackson. Um, so just wanted to make sure we gave them um, a shout out and a huge welcome as well. And um, Brent Luther at Hull Jackson and Rhonda Bledsoe at Two Rivers, just to specifically call them my name. Um, I know, uh, Dr. Battle, this is just the beginning of looking at um, TCAP scores and student achievement results. Can you give us a sense of what else we might see in the, in, and when? If, if you, um, you can anticipate um, a um, full kind of data dive into TN Ready, both achievement and growth. Growth, we've not received that information yet, but our typical um, update um, from our research assessment and evaluation team is forthcoming. We're still um, getting data and information and little tweaks um, in data. So as we get that finalized, we will prepare that full presentation for the board as well, and we'll also update you once we receive um, our TVOS um, information. Okay. That's a future director's report. Oh, Ms. Masters. I just want to ask if any previously interim principals had been appointed at and the permanent position. Yes, we do have a few um, principals who served last school year who have moved from the interim to the full executive principal space. Oh, you're putting me on the spot. I better not forget anybody. So, um, um, Mr. Michael Pratt, um, the interim um, principal to the executive principal space. Um, Casey. Casey. Casey Campbell at um, Cockrell Elementary School. Um, Hall. Oh, Hank Staggs at Creve Hall. Yeah. Wits it. Right. Lauren, Lauren 
Marina Rucker at Whitsett Elementary School as well. And 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 yes, those principals at the next board meeting team to capture this. We will celebrate. I'm sorry, I'm our sorry to put you on the spot. Um, <laughs> principalships, but really, really, I'm proud of this cohort of um, new leaders. They have hit the ground running. They have been in place. Um, everyone before um, the start of June. So really excited about um, what's to come and the instructional leadership moves that we're making as a district. So thank you, um, sorry, board member. Um, I just got to tell you, Stratford Cluster is excited. <laughs> they are, yeah. I mean, literally, like, me. having pep rallies over it. it. It's been. Sean said, let's just do it right now. Let's not wait. Okay, right let's now. do it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, uh, John Haffrey at uh, Cora Howe. Um, yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Dr. Hank Staggs, as we said. Also, interim uh, Celia Jolly at Croft Middle School. Uh, we've got uh, Dr. Brent Luther's interim at Hull Jackson. Dr. Tisha Wilson, interim to full at Jones Padilla. They, y'all, they've been doing this thing for so long. Uh, I think Wilson's we already got Dr. Too. Michael Pratt, um, and then uh, Dr. Rhonda Bledsoe's interim at Two Rivers. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. she was interim. Dr. Rucker. So there we go. We love our teachers and we love our principals as well. So congratulations to all of you. Thank you. Uh, to board members, I encourage you. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Ms. Tyler. Okay, well, let me, I'll finish mine real quick then. Um, I would encourage y'all, if you can, to join the meet and greets that your different principals are having inside of your districts. It's been really exciting to be a part of those. It's some of our first years of not having to do those virtually. Um, and so it's exciting to get to be a part of not only that environment and the students, but also to see the excitement and hear from our staff as well. So I encourage us to be there and of course introduce yourself to your new principals as they come. All right, Ms. Tyler, you have a question or concern? Um, no, not a question. Just one more thing. I, I think it's important to celebrate when we recognize that, that we are making strides in the ways we are being measured. And, I, and I'm very proud of the strides that we have made. I'm extremely proud of the fact that when you compare us to growth, which is the hardest thing, where you're trying to continue to push kids beyond, that we are making big strides. And I'm very, very proud of that. But I also want to say that one test is not all of our kids. And I'm also really proud of the fact that we have a heavy emphasis on SEL, on social and emotional learning in MMPS, because we recognize that one test on one day does not define each of our students, and that um, they are so much more than that. So I'm proud of the, the movement that we're making, but I also want us to continue to recognize that that one test is just a piece of the puzzle. So, thank you. Berthina. Hi, I, I just want to follow up and say that I'm, I'm really excited about the new principals, especially in District 4. Y'all yeah, know I rocked down on District 4 and, and really excited about the incoming principals. I was able to attend all of the open houses and meet and greets um, and love the way each principal set the tone for what the school year will look like. Um, and so Dr. Battle knows I called like, yeah. Um, so I'm really excited about the work that they're doing. I'm also excited about um, um, the selection process and how principals were chosen specifically for these schools. And I look forward to the upward mobility that they will have within the school, the progress that they will meet, make and the changes that they will see. I also want to acknowledge that um, post-pandemic, we have had a lot of naysayers um, across our community talk really bad about the potential for our students and our families within MNPS, as well as MNPS as a whole in really supporting and growing students. I will say that, and thank you to Dr. Battle and her team and, and the leadership across our district, we are making some very intentional progress across our district. We have, uh, last year we, we did post-pandemic, we recovered post-pandemic levels when, when people said that we couldn't do it. Um, we defied the odds. 
Um, this year, people said, oh, it was just a fluke last year, and we have continued to make the necessary improvements. And so that says a lot about the intentional work. And if you work in a school, if you're in the classroom, even as a parent, the intentional work of really pushing your students and providing that support that they need in order to be successful, I think it really takes a collaborative team for that to happen, and we are seeing that. And so I want to make sure that we are not remiss in, in, in putting that out there. Um, we are doing some amazing work. Do we need to continue? Absolutely, but we are on the right track um, to make steps year after year after year to get our students where they need to be. Um, and so I'm really, really excited about that and really focused on that. And I really appreciate Dr. Battle and her team for laying that vision out um, and, and making sure that we are all held accountable um, to what's best for kids. Um, and so in, in, in our district, we know, and even with children, we know that we have to work hard hard to eliminate barriers so that learning can take place. And so the, in the, the additional programming that we provide within our district around social emotional health and support and all of the other wraparound services and things that we provide students and families in our district, I really, really appreciate that and really see the impact that it is making um, for our kids and student learning. On top of that, I have had a chance to travel across the country this summer. And it's amazing to see that MNPS is leading in a lot of this work. A lot of districts across our nation are trying to figure out how they can do what MNPS is doing. Then you get back to the city and MNPS ain't worth a crap. But everybody else is trying to figure out how do they implement SEL support? How do they implement summer programming the way that we are implementing summer programming? How are we doing growth despite the pandemic and the challenges that our families are having? And so we are lead our academies of Nashville. So it, it goes on and on. And so I don't want to be remiss in saying that we are perfect. We are far from perfect. We know that we have a lot of work to do, but we also need to recognize that we are leading the country in a lot of this work, um, and we're going to continue to push regardless of the naysayers. And so thank you, Dr. Battle, to your team and the leadership here that we are going to continue to work, um, and, and also a testament to our board on how we work together, even if we continue to disagree. And so I just really appreciate um, the model that we have moving forward as we continue to do this work. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. All right, that brings us to public participation. We have seven people that have signed up for public participation. That list is coming up on our screen in a minute. Uh, each person has three minutes to speak. We ask that you give us your name. Um, and if you can, what district you live within, you do not need to give us your address um, unless you just so choose to. Um, within that three minutes, we ask that you, of course, introduce yourself. And then at the end of it, you will hear a bell. Very beautiful bell. So you'll hear that bell at the end of the three minutes, and then the next person will speak. You're welcome to queue up behind each other if you would like to, um, and I will say last names. So the first person we have that's here to speak is Miss Jones. Um, good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Brenda Jones, and I'm the founder of Invictus Nashville Charter School. Um, I come before you again um, as the last time in this cycle to ask for you to vote to approve this charter school. I have struggled to figure out exactly what I wanted to convey in this conversation um, in my limited time. And one thing that there are a few things that I'll try to get out. And the first thing would be um, I met with the majority of the board um, at different times throughout this part process. Um, coming forward to ask for a fair shot, trying to figure out exactly what it is um, that I could do to improve, to grow as a leader, and to make sure that I can bring this vision to life. Um, understanding that and meeting with people and talking to people because I am not into politics, I learned a lot. Um, and I think I took a lot of the feedback and tried my best to implement it. Um, 
The unfortunate part of this is that I know that you guys don't read 450 page applications, okay? I know um, some of you did, okay? And I know um, some of you um, get the review and that's what you have. So I know my intent today and the intent of the people who are speaking will be to provide you with evidence that might contradict exactly what was in the review so that you can have a discussion and to make an informed decision. Because whether or not we agree on what the rubric asks us to, to put in the application, that's the merit in which Invictus should be judged upon. And in my personal opinion, and things that you will hear and see today, I don't feel like the rubric was used to give me the appropriate feedback. So as you have seen the amended re review and you've seen the things that have come, come out of that review, I was shocked to find that we were partially meet expectations all the way through the first time around with explicit instructions to only change the things that were recommended for us to change. And upon making those changes, two of the categories now do not meet expectations. And I struggled as an educator to see how, if I told a student this is the bar, you have a B, change what I asked you to change, and then they did the work and came back and received a C, I, it, it didn't make sense to me. Um, so we dug in, we have evidence to give you what you need to have a discussion and an informed, you know, to make sure you are informed on both ends before you vote. Um, and I hope that you are able to take that information and do what you will. Because no matter how hard it is, even if something is wrong, it's time for people to start to say, I disagree and it's okay to disagree within any organization, within any structure, because I stand on the side of what's just and what's right. So please vote for Invictus. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Kristen Doran. Good evening, Chair and members of the board. My name is Christine Dorn, and I am here from Washington, D.C. I am here to respond to the evidence findings specifically for the uh, facilities findings. Uh, the first one being not meeting requirements for a storm shelter. Um, we have assembled a project team, and based on our architect and our builder's inputs, uh, this code is typically applied to new construction and significant renovation. We know that there is also precedent uh, for a waiver to be given for short-term leases, which is what Invictus would pursue. Um, that said, we are committed to work with uh, Metro to meet and exceed anything that's required to get a permit and certificate of occupancy. The second finding we want to respond to is uh, providing adequate space to meet enrollment requirements. Um, within the papers that you should have, there is an exhibit that is a blocking plan that shows that we will be able to meet requirements within year one um, for enrollment. In addition to that, we have included the right of first refusal for our lease um, so that we'll have the ability to expand into adjacent suites. The third and fourth findings, which I'm going to respond to together, um, were about not having adequate funding for tenant improvements and not having adequate funding for renovation costs. With the lease that we are pursuing, we anticipate receiving $394,000 in tenant improvement funding. That's in addition to the $200,000 referenced in the application that will also go to project costs. We believe that is sufficient in that we plan to reuse a lot of the existing infrastructure and the base building systems in this particular space that we're pursuing were built for a call center. So the infrastructure actually lends to the requirements for the school, including adequate HVAC capacity. So we'll deal with distribution. Uh, there are already life and fire safety systems that are in place. There are adequate restroom fixtures and counts to support the school in year one. It is ADA compliant. Uh, there is a generator serving the space and there is adequate parking for staff, which means that we will not have to purchase additional parking for the school. So we believe that we are in a good position to meet and exceed any requirements from a facilities perspective in year one and beyond. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next is Allison McGuire. Good evening, I'm Allison McGuire. I live in District 8. 
We all understand the power of a rubric. A rubric communicates expectations. It frames what is considered acceptable work. When we review work, we all come to it with our own preferences about how it should be. But like a great pair of glasses, the rubric brings us back to focus on what is required so we can drop our assumptions. It ought to be the great equalizer. As we tried to understand and integrate the first round of feedback we received, we were confused. Some of the critique brought up elements that are not part of the rubric. Some of it contradicted the rubric. Some of it contradicted itself. We requested a meeting to further understand where we were missing the mark. We were denied this meeting, which we understand is not part of the process. So we tried to address as many of the concerns as we could. As you seek to make an informed decision regarding our financial plan and capacity, please consider these things. One, we were penalized for not having a permanent site. Your rubric does not require one. It requires a plan to acquire a site and a timeline for opening. We required both. Two, we were penalized for not having sufficient funds for facility costs and tenant improvements. This is an unfounded assumption. At the time we submitted the application, we had yet to acquire a permanent site. So it wouldn't have been possible to judge that we didn't have the funds to cover the costs. And as you just heard, we're covered in that department. Finally, this part of the application has 10 sections. Nine of them were deemed acceptable. Critiques came from just one of the 10 sections. Absent further conversation or clarification, I cannot understand how passing nine out of 10 translates to did not meet expectations. In both versions of our application, we provided details about our upgrades and our costs, and those should be outlined in attachment C in the papers in front of you. After reviewing this information and hearing from our facilities team, I hope you will find that we met expectations, and I hope that you will vote yes for Invictus Nashville. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Next is Ms. Taylor. Hello. Hi, I'm Nasa Taylor. I live in District 6. In our last meeting, we stood before you and addressed the misconception regarding the feedback and the Montessori model. Unfortunately, again, we received feedback that still demonstrates a misunderstanding of that model. In the original review, it was stated that although the founder, Dr. Brenda Jones, described a curriculum development plan that ensured alignment, the review team was still concerned that state law would not be followed. In response, Dr. Jones created nine pages of tables to demonstrate how the materials aligned to the state standards. As you can see in attachment E that was distributed earlier, she also shared the tables through, that the tables were a sampling of subjects to show her approach to aligning the Montessori model with the required standards. Additional alignment would be completed during the planning year. Let's look at the most recent feedback that we received in our amended application. The new feedback states that the curriculum is not cohesively aligned to state standard and focus on the fact that students in first grades are introduced to decimal place values, although that isn't a standard until fourth grade. Well, in the application, we address that. Again, we present examples of curriculum alignment and share that more will be developed during our planning year. But what worries me more is the example given regarding decimal points. It seems that we're being penalized for exceeding the standards and expecting students to become exceptional scholars. I'm sure you understand that the Montessori model allows for students to learn at an individualized pace within mixed grade bands. This unique model allows students to advance their understanding of how foundational concepts build upon one another. Also, if there is such scrutiny of the Montessori model as has been demonstrated by the feedback to the Invictus application, I do wonder how MMPS aligns curriculum with state standards at the other two Montessori schools in the district. Does their curriculum align? If that answer is yes, then of course, so will the curriculum at Invictus. As you know, standards change and evolve frequently, and every school leader must revisit scope and sequencing to ensure alignment. And Dr. Jones is more than capable of ensuring that Invictus will be aligned as well. We hope that you take that into consideration when you make an informed decision about how you're voting today, and we hope that you vote for Invictus. Thank you for your time. Thank you. David Goodcase. 
David, good case. Okay, Jonathan Williamson. All right, uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm a Nashville native here, and I'm here in support of Invictus, Invictus Nashville Charter School. Um, as a parent that believes we should have more school options, um, I'm a parent that also believes that our black and brown families need access to Montessori schools. As someone who believes in our own MMPS system, um, I'm in strong support of Invictus here today. Um, I graduated in um, National School of the Arts, District 5, and we had a lot of resources that were limited and currently still do today. But uh, thankfully, MMPS provided us with a system where I could learn and develop and grow and stand for you here today. Unfortunately, that's not the same for many of my colleagues, many of my friends, um, many people here from the 37208 area code specifically. And some of my friends grew up with better resources. Some of my friends went to higher education than I went to. Some of my friends were open to other different access and portals. A lot of times they were open to different perspectives that were out of the box. Um, different tools, different resources that were different. Some of my friends got real creative, right? They came and they built organizations. They got groups together. They have masses of people here with you. One of these friends in particular I'm talking to is Ms. Brenda Jones. She is an advocate here for Nashville, Dr. Brenda Jones. And she's brought this program here and I'm a little troubled um, that so much red tape, so much bureaucracy is being added to this process. You just add a simple Montessori school to provide students greater access than I had, that she had, that many other students here in Nashville still do not have. So. I can pat MMPS on the back in one hand, and on the other side, I still see a need for other options for kids to learn. Um, that's that. Um, some of the things that the other people have stated on, it, it varies in different things that are needed, different requirements, different benchmarks. I believe that's been met. A lot of those have been met, and other speakers have spoken towards those directly. I'm just a Nashville native. MMPS supporter again that would love to see Invictus Nashville added into what we have going on. Um, with that, I thank you all for your time. I would like for you all to reconsider this vote and get one additional program for our youth in the future in Nashville. Um, that would be great. God bless you. Good to see you. How are you doing? And um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Ms. Wade. Good evening, I'm Dewana Wade and I reside in District, Floor, District 4. Every school year, school leaders are, undergo what's called duty of care. This includes budget projections, staffing updates, updating curriculum and ensuring that the school calendar is feasible for the upcoming school year. We at Invictus have been cited for not being in compliance with a recently updated law that would impact our schedule for an abbreviated day. We provided a rationale and our interpretation of the law in the amended application and invite you to look at attachment D. Although this information was included in the amendment, we are still being told that we violate the law. It is our belief that this falls under the scope of duty of care. This can be rectified within our planning year and updated if we are indeed incorrect in our interpretation and remedy. This issue should not rise to the level of does not meet standards, leading to non-approval as duty of care regarding schedules, et cetera, will take place every single school year. The second sighting we received was on errors with our requested waivers. We reviewed the waivers from the most recent charter cycle, which was approved by the state, and updated our application based on those findings. In the event the listed waivers are incorrect, again, we have the planning year to correct. Those identified waivers of concern would not impact the work that needs to be done to open our doors in 2024. Finally. 
We are cited twice around transportation. The reviewer stated there's a discrepancy within the budget narrative and the budget worksheet as it relates to transportation. There also remains a finding for insufficient funds for transportation, though this citing was updated in the amended application. We invite you to look at attachment B. This attachment demonstrates that we adjusted our budget per amendments in both the budget worksheet and the narrative match. We used the expense amounts based on the expertise of EdTech and through our research provided from local charters and school busing comps. We respectfully ask that the board consider that this also does not rise to the level of does not meet expectations in one section of a 12 subpart application. Within the last two years, MNPS School Board approved a charter application with multiple partially meets expectation sightings. We respectfully request similar considerations. Please vote yes for Invictus Nashville. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so that ends public participation. Okay, I was like, you looked momentarily panicked. So it smelled smoke, okay. It is just heated, it's not smoke, but yeah. Okay, so thank you for those being in, uh, here for public participation. That brings us to our governance issues. So for our consent agenda, we have kind of a long one today because we have not only our typical purchases and contracts under A1, a as minutes and B as purchases and contracts, but we also have C as board policies, which we just discussed in our uh, governance meeting that we had at four o'clock. So before we get to those, um, I need a motion to approve the consent agenda as listed. Motion uh, to approve. Oh. I'm sorry, I needed to remove an item for to vote separately because of a conflict. Okay. okay. It's um, A, one, B, three. <laughs> A, one, <laughs> B, three. Thank you. That's it. That's it. No problem. We forgot it. Thank you. Motion to approve consent ex ex the consent agenda with the removal of A, one, B, three. Second. There we go. All right. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Thank you, that is unanimous. I make a motion to approve A1B3. Second. All right, all those in favor? That is unanimous. All no, those it's not unanimous. Well, it's not unanimous. She abstained. Uh, so uh, do we have any abstentions? abstentions? <laughs> we have one. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, that brings us to. Try to keep you legal. The second part of our agenda, which is the New START amended charter school applications. And for that, I will turn it to Dr. Battle. Thank you so much. Thank you again, Chair Elrod. Um, at this time, I would um, like to invite up Director uh, Sharika Robert Grant, who leads our charter office, to lead the board through um, the New START amended charter school applications. Thank you, Dr. Battle. Madam Chair, uh, members of the board and Director Battle, thank you for the opportunity to share the Charter Office Review Team's reports on three New START amended charter applications. This evening, we will present the findings of the New START amended applications for Pathways in Education, Invictus Nashville, and Nashville Collegiate Prep High School. TCA 49-13-108 states, upon receipt of the ground for denial, the sponsor has 30 days from receipt to submit an amended application to correct the deficiencies. The local board of education has 60 days from receipt of an amended application to deny or to approve the amended application. The Office of Charter Schools, which is responsible for ensuring the quality authorizing for 27 existing charter school, leads the authorization process by coordinating internal and external experts to review each application and presents evidence findings reports to the Board of Education. 
The review and rating of the New START amended applications consisted of a variety of members from multiple MNPS de departments that included academics, special populations, facilities planning, strategic investments, research and assessment, operations, curriculum, an external reviewer, and teaching and learning. The review committee evaluates the New START amended application utilizing the published evaluation criteria from the Tennessee Department of Education. The review team looks for responses of corrected deficiencies outlined and identified in the original New START application. The evaluation team reaches consensus and provides a rating of meets or exceeds the standard, partially meets the standard, or does not meet the standard for each section. Review team members rated each section of the New START amended application that consisted of the following categories. Academic plan design and capacity, operations plan and capacity, financial plan and capacity, and portfolio review performance record. The review team utilized the rubric provided by TDOE to determine the rating for each section in the New START amended application. The ratings included meets or exceeds the standard. The responses within the application reflects a thorough understanding of key issues. It clearly aligns with the mission and vision of the school. And the responses include specific and accurate information that shows thorough preparation. Partially meets the standard. The response meets the criteria in some respects, but lacks sufficient detail and or requires additional information in one or more areas and does not meet the standard. The response is incomplete, demonstrates lack of preparation, does not align with the mission and vision of the school, or otherwise raises significant concerns about the viability of the plan or the applicant's ability to carry it out. Tonight, the board can consider the review team's findings and whether each new start amended application should be approved or denied. State law requires each charter application must be considered and voted on separately. Note, a sponsor may appeal a local board of education's decision to deny the public charter school application to the charter commission no later than 10 days after the date of the local board of education's decision. We will begin with the new start amended application for pathways in education. Pathways in Education is proposing an alternative high school with a flexible hybrid schedule for at-risk students. The grade span proposed is 9 through 12 with an enrollment cap of 350 students in the Glencliff Cluster. This overview highlights just a few of the original New Star application documented concerns from review team members that was presented to the board on April 25th, 2023. There were concerns regarding the compliance of the service model, the closure of two schools in Memphis, inadequate student support services for meals and transportation, allowability and compliance of waivers as well as the hybrid model, a lack of clarity in calculating the per pupil revenue, as well as inadequate pre-opening expense and tenant improvements. In a review of the amended New Star application, the evidence findings are listed within the board report and are as follows. In academics, the application lacks details around student scheduling and how that would impact funding and viability to determine if the hybrid model is allowable under TCA 49-13-106D. In addition, the application lacks detail around student scheduling and staffing for English learners. In operations, the application still does not address the applicant having only three board members or that none of the three members have a local presence. 
Additionally, the application still has numerous errors in the waiver submitted, causing concerns for allowability for approval. The startup plan does not have a logical timeline or address the realities of a Nashville real estate market, nor does, it, does the application address the significant renovations required to make a commercial space meet educational occupancy requirements related to the timeline or the budget. And lastly, the application still does not adequately explain the termination of the Memphis contracts. In financials, there is still a lack of tracking and funding per student related to school-based budgets, budgets and Tennessee investment in student achievement. And the application does not reflect salaries consistent with a year-round school. In portfolio review performance record, this section was not applicable based on the category type and not reviewed or rated by review members. TCA 49-13-10C states that an LEA may deny on the basis that the opening of the charter school would cause a substantial negative fiscal impact on the district. In showing the fiscal impact, MMPS utilizes the number of projected students for the proposed charter school and the difference between the estimated per pupil amount for charter schools and the average student base budgeted per pupil amount for traditional schools. This amount shows the estimated negative fiscal impact to the district assuming students are opting out of an MMPS school to attend the proposed charter. The following chart indicates the negative fiscal impact for years one through capacity for pathways in education. I will highlight years one and year capacity negative fiscal impact to MMPS. In year one, with an enrollment target of 225 students, the negative fiscal impact to MMPS would be 1,777,500. And at capacity with 350 students, the negative fiscal impact would be 2,765,000. The review team determined the ratings for the academic plan design and capacity section as partially meets standard. For operations plan and capacity, partially meets standard. For financial plan and capacity, partially meets standard. And for portfolio review and performance record, this section was not applicable. I will turn it over to the board for the discussion and vote for the New Star amended application for Pathways in Education. Thank you so much. I'll start with a motion. Um, I make a motion to deny Pathways um, application, amended application um, due for not for only partially meeting standards. Um, Madam Chair, I just ask if we, there are specific areas concern, if the board has specific areas concern that have been addressed by the charter team and would like the all the charter team's findings included as well, you know, given that the review is on these specific areas of concern. Uh, we could amend it. Uh, it could be motion second, we could discuss, but it just... It hasn't been seconded yet. I withdraw my motion. Okay, I'll let you handle it. Right, Ms. Masters. I'll, I'll make the motion. I move that we deny this application um, first based on all of the findings of our charter school office, based on the state approved standards for reviewing these applications. Additionally, because of the concerns for the allowability of approval, um, and most specifically, the concern around TCA 4913106D and whether or not a hybrid model is even allowable under state law. Um, the concern around the salaries not being at the standard for a full time school and the negative fiscal impact in relation to the lack of any demonstrated potential for positive impact of any kind. 
Second. Um, can you okay. just repeat the first grounds for your motion? The first grounds was based on the fact that our charter school office um, did did not find that it met the standards for approval. Right, it's been motion. Do we have a second? Yeah, I second it. Second him. Right. Any discussion? This player. Um, as I said earlier, well, in the first, the first application, um, I do like the concept of the school. Um, I think that's some, and part of it is is just um, the process. The application matters. Going through the details. Um, and there are specific things I have concerns with, um, especially over the, the governance of it. But um, that was brought up in the charter school charter committee, <laughs> or office, sorry, in the right words, uh, combined. Um, and so I, w I think we have to look at the full picture of it. Um, yeah, I know. Oh, thank you. Um, and so I, was, I, so I just want to put the record. I, I think as we look at um, educations and different models that really educate our children in the 21st century, we still have a governance and a fiduciary responsibility how the details, how there are standards, state law, state, um, and state code regarding education, which makes it difficult that we're all held to um, in some form or another. And I think as we become the as we as the authorizing body have to hold up to those same standards. Um, that's all I have to say. Any additional comments? I have two questions. Uh, one, I would ask my colleague, Ms. Player, since it represents, it's in your district for Glencliff, has there been an outpour of support for this or has there been support that you've received? inside your district? I have not received any correspondence or communication um, supporting the school from my constituents. Thank you. And then my additional question would be, uh, does this fit our strategic needs based upon our national reimagined work that we have coming up? Do we need these seats in that district? Does this fit our desires that we have coming up inside that area? Does it fit those things? Um, no, and I'm just kind of looking out at it. Um, no, ma'am, there's not a demand for additional seats in this particular cluster of the reimagined work. Okay. I did not believe so. Okay. Thank you. All right, be no further questions or comments. We have a motion. It is to deny, though I will not restate it in its entirety, but it was thorough. Um, do you have a question? You may, you may go ahead. Yes, I'll allow it. I, I think I stated this in the original review, but one of the things that stood out to me was that um, Pathways in Education, Memphis, had both low performance and closure issues. Yes. Um, and so um, that is an issue that would be on my mind when voting on this. Thank you. All right, so we have a motion that's been first and seconded. All those in favor of denying Pathways in Education, please raise your hand. That is, that is unanimous. Thank you so much. All right. The next New Star amended application is Invictus Nashville. Invictus Nashville is proposing a community co-design learning model with the Montessori Elementary and project-based learning middle school. The grade span proposed is K through eight with an enrollment cap of 792 students in the McGavick cluster. This overview highlights a few of the original New Star application documented concerns from review team members presented to the board on April the 25th, 2023. There were multiple responses in, which embedded the use of Common Core, which violates chapters 205 and 471 of the Public Acts of 2021, as well as the school calendar not meeting the required six and a half hours of daily instruction per day. Also, the application lacked a definitive permanent school site. There were numerous errors in the waiver submitted, along with insufficient funding for transportation for students, 
as well as students with disabilities, and there was no funds for facility renovations in year one that will sustain growth. In a review of the New START amended application, the evidence findings are listed within the board report and are as follows. In academics, the applicant still does not address why there is a need for a charter school in this cluster. The curriculum is not cohesively aligned to state standards. The school calendar presents concerns for allowability. The screening and progress monitoring plan for students is not streamlined and will lead to overtesting. Lastly, the application lacks details of how WIDA standards for English learners will be integrated within the curriculum. In operations, the identified facilities do not meet building code requirements for storm shelters, nor provide adequate space for the projected number of students. The application still has numerous errors in the waiver submitted, causing concerns for allowability for approval. Additionally, the application has discrepancies between the narrative and the budget related to transportation. In financials, there are insufficient funds for the cost for tenant improvements, facility renovations, as well as transportation costs. In the portfolio review performance record, this section was not applicable based on the category type and not reviewed or rated by review members. TCA 49-13-108C states that an LEA may deny on the basis that the opening of the charter school would cause a substantial negative fiscal impact on the district. MMPS utilizes the number of projected students for the proposed charter school and the difference between the estimated per pupil amount for the charter school and the average student base budgeted per pupil amount for traditional schools. The following chart indicates the negative fiscal impact for years one through capacity for Invictus Nashville. I will highlight years one and year capacity for the negative fiscal impact to MMPS. In year one, with an enrollment target of 144 students, the negative fiscal impact to MMPS would be $1,137,600. And at capacity, with 792 students, the negative fiscal impact to MMPS would be $6,256,800. The review team determined the ratings for Invictus Nashville as follows. Partially meets standards in academic plan design and capacity, does not meet standard in operations plan and capacity, does not meet standard in financial plan and capacity, and portfolio review performance record was not applicable. I will turn it over to the board for the discussion and vote for the new start amended application for Invictus Nashville. Thank you. I'll entertain a motion. I'll move that we deny this application based on it not meeting any of the standards of the application process as reported by our charter school office. Also, that it doesn't meet any of the standards as defined within the rubric. Also noting of specific concern that the lack of details around WIDA standards for English learners is of specific concern in MMPS, given that 28% of our students have limited English profici proficiency and in addition to that, the potential for negative fiscal impact upon MMPS in relation to the lack of a demonstration of potential for positive impact, those are the reasons why I am moving that we deny this application. Is there a second? Okay. It's been second. It's been first and seconded. Discussion, do we have any questions or comments? I will start with Ms. Bugs. 
Thank you, Chair Elrod. And thank you to those of you that came out to speak, to support Dr. Jones. Dr. Jones, your resume is more than impressive. To be an MMPS graduate, to want to pour back into Nashville students, I applaud you, I appreciate you. Uh, having conversations with you to understand what your goal was in opening this school, I certainly appreciated the detail you were able to offer me. Um, and as I told you then, though, that as a fellow Nashville native, as a what, fifth generation Nashvilleian, fifth generation North Nashvilleian, I support you, but I cannot support the opening of a brand new school. I typically haven't spoken in the last couple of years since I've not been chair just because it was a lot to be chair. So thank you again, Chair Elrod, for what you do. But I did feel it was important around this charter school conversation to make sure that I explain to the community what's going on and so you understand our rationale at least a bit more. For me, it's not at all about ideology. I started my career as a, an educator in a charter school. I was not qualified to be a teacher yet. And a charter school gave me an opening. They gave me a position because they had the autonomy to. The state wouldn't let me teach in a traditional school, but a charter school would. So I appreciated that. Um, the state does not offer us more funding when we open a new school. Right now, we have 159 schools. To open any one new brand school, money has to be taken from those schools, from that pot of money. So from my son, from her daughter, his child, that money has to come from those children in those schools because, unfortunately, the state won't say, well, we see progress, we see innovation, and we want to invest in that. That's just not what, that, what happens. We end up having to pull from the 127 traditionally run schools. That money comes from them, right? And so I, I struggle to, to pull money from my own child's school, from the other 32 schools in my own district, because that is where money will be coming from. Again, this is not a slight towards you at all. It is the idea that we as a community, we as a, a state, we as a nation, are not investing in children, and we're not investing in innovation. So I just want to stress that I, I understand that this does not feel good, but I can't help but want to reinforce to you that you are a professional that we appreciate, but I also that I've got to, as an elected official, as a policymaker, be mindful about how every single decision, every single uh, push towards progress will come at a cost. And unfortunately, I cannot cost those in my neighborhood. I live, I, to Mr. Williamson's point, I live in 37208. Raising my son, he goes to the same school I attended in elementary school. They had to, and please don't hurt me, Dr. Battle. And I love my principal. It was not her fault at all. She just didn't know. We had to cancel a field trip or had to reschedule a field trip because we could not come up with $500. $500. Now, that was partly because, you know, the teachers that are phenomenal just didn't know but that we had to cancel it, because that's what happens when you don't have enough resources. Please don't get it hurt. I, we'll, we'll circle back to that. I'll, I'll defend my principal you know, anywhere. But that's, I just want to paint that picture, that this is not saying that your model could not be beneficial, that it could not be beneficial. It's the idea that I would have to pull from students, I would have to pull from um, teacher salaries, I would have to pr potentially not hire some positions to be able to open that school, and I struggle with that. Um, I also hope to just educate those that are looking to to rally around Dr. Jones and around just charter schools and reform efforts. The idea that TISA does harm to Nashville. Dr. Battle can't say it, but I'll say it for her. It harms us because Nashville is the economic engine of this state and the state is not pouring. So we're pushing so much money to the state of Tennessee and we don't get much back. And then that ends up hurting us. Our city is actually doing what they're supposed to be doing. They're finding dollars where they can, but we have to do better about advocating at the state. We started reaching out to the Charter Commission to try to offer this explanation and say, look, we, we want to work with charter schools. We want to work with reform efforts. We are looking to do better by all students. They wouldn't meet with us. I met with the board chair, and he was not quite ready for us to meet with them, and that was three years ago. But that's something that we as a board can continue to push on. Unfortunately, Dr. Jones and Invictus family, you all are going to get caught in the crosshairs of this battle with the state around what reform efforts look like and what it means to actually support and educate children. Because what I've always found interesting is that these national reform efforts, people that are not from Nashville, don't live here but fly in, that they are not looking to open up a charter school in North Nashville. They're not looking to serve children that live in Cumberland View, Dodge City, or in Cheatham Place. They're not. When we look at our, char when we look at our choice schools across Nashville, most of them do not come from low-income housing projects. They don't come from low SES families. They more often than not come from, at the very least, middle-class families. I, too, Mr. Williamson, was a student that attended a magnet school.
And I think about how everybody on my street went to that magnet school. And had we not been rezoned, and had we actually been able to go to White's Creek, how all of our families' influence, how all of our families' fundraising capability, how everything we poured into MLK, which I love, would have been poured into that zone school. So this is, again, this is not for me ideology. This is the idea that we have a state that is just not funding us. And if we open this new school, unfortunately, that means that every, every person in this uh, sitting here, every person that's watching that has a child in MNPS, your child's school will funding will be pulled from those schools to, to, to start this fresh start. So I, I look forward to hopefully working with you in the future. I've, I've told you before that there are different ways that Dr. Battle and her team are engaging in different innovation. And Mr. Williamson, I don't mean for you to catch this stray. I don't mean to keep uh, pointing at you. It's just I appreciate the North Nashville connection. But um, when we think about being able to pull in um, another Montessori model, because we have one at Hull Jackson in North Nashville. I think y'all have Stanford, Stanford in um, Dr. Nabal McKinney's area, but we're looking to write grants. You know, we started realizing seven years ago that we, we could write grants for STEAM magnet schools, where we could pour, uh, you know, we could support a Ricky Gibbs at Warner Elementary, where we were pulling a million dollars a year into that school, and that school did better. Interestingly enough, when you resource a school, the children do better. You may not know this, but 65% of black and brown students in Nashville come into first grade or grade level behind. Now, this is old data. But that's, the, and not that we should only focus on any one sub, sub demographic of student, but if the idea is to make sure that we are supporting the least of these, the most disenfranchised, I cannot in good conscience strip from those students funding and pour it somewhere else. So again, I, I look forward to seeing you continue to thrive. You're making our ancestors proud. You're making Nashville proud. But I cannot, again, in good conscience, vote to support this opening right now. Thank you for considering. So I actually, I have a question. Um, so I, I did notice that, and, and I know this was pointed out in the, um, uh, in the public comment period, that some of the ratings changed. Um, and can you explain how a rating might change from, and I, it was surprising to me as well that a rating could go down after an initial review versus going up, which one that sort of like logically might occur. Can you explain just a little bit about how that occurs and why? Yes. Um, so in the original application, if um, sponsors do not meet the standard and the application is denied, they have the opportunity to submit the amended application. The purpose of the amended application is to correct the deficiencies. And so uh, sponsors include additional information to attempt to correct the original deficiency noted in the original application. Um, if that additional information weakens and does not strengthen um, the noted deficiency in the original application, the review team still utilizes the rubric to rate those responses. And so in an attempt to address the original concerns, applicants sometimes may provide additional information that actually weakens their original response. And so, um, as noted in the board report, um, review members took the additional information that was provided in the amended uh, New Star application and utilized the rubric to rate that additional information that was provided. Thank you. And and I in the um, were there new things mentioned in the. Um, in the amended review, or were things were mentioned in the amended review noted in the original review? So review members are charged with um, reading the sections that are highlighted. Um, applicants are told to highlight that information that they would like for review members to uh, incorporate in their rating. And so if they highlighted information that may have been new, it can be utilized to determine the overall rating in the amended uh, New Star application process. So an example of that, because I, I did read the I did read a number of portions of the or both original application and uh, amended application. Um, an example of that is actually the scope and sequence that was or the the standards table that was included um, and actually was referenced in public comment. Um, and and within that um, 
that is sort of that that was an additional thing that was that was put into the application that was asked for and in the review comments where it mentions specifically that actually those things aren't directly aligned to state standards that's because it was a new element to the application is that correct yes it was a new element that was highlighted for review right. members to take into consideration yeah. okay. yes okay thanks um so those were sort of my questions that, that, that things that i had also noted um, and just, you know, from the comments perspective, I just want to, um, I, I also want to um, compliment Dr. Jones on, and, and team on, on the work that they've done so far, um, both in, in conversation and then also in, in my own review of the application. Um, there were a few things that, that sort of came up for me that, um, that I would have liked to have seen be stronger in the application. Um, so first, I, I agree with the sort of overall sentiment I, I read in the report offered by the uh, review committee um, that that the Montessori, the descriptions of the Montessori um, uh, Montessori program, Montessori style, how the school will take Montessori and implement it, were not at the level I would have liked to have seen to um, to have a school open next year. I understand there's opportunities in the um, in the planning year to do more work there, but I personally would have liked to have seen much better descriptions um, of how Montessori, both of, of, of what Montessori is, um, how it is, uh, how it can be implemented, what examples are of how students are going to work in Montessori sort of day to day, what advantages that gives to all students, specifically to students um, with disabilities. I think there were plenty of opportunity, there was plenty of opportunity in my mind given some you know research I've done in Montessori, et cetera, for there to be a better description there. And I was, I was disappointed to, to see that um, that there wasn't. I also think um, there were some things around sort of enrollment, and this was noted in the application or in the review of the application as well, around demand and enrollment in the particular area that this is being proposed for. And, and Dr. Jones and I discussed this. I, I didn't see where the case was proven, um, and this is noted in the in the review that this particular school is needed in this particular area. Um, and where there were sort of data and evidence around numbers of students or demand um, that that seemed to rise to um, the need for a new school uh, in this particular area, and and so um, you know those couple of things alone are not necessarily enough uh, to want to say no to something. Um, but I do think those, to me, those are two of the most important things we can be looking at. Um, academic program, academic structure, strength of academic plan, need for a school, um, and coupled with some of the issues that the team found um, in terms of uh, in terms of financials, which you know may well be able to be corrected in a planning year, but also um, are things that I think you know we should know about before we say, yeah, let's let's go forward. Um, those are my concerns with the application. So thank you for the opportunity to comment. Thank you, Dr. Nama McKinney. Okay, Dr. Gentry. A process question. So I'm, I'm just trying to understand. So we submit an application. There are some findings. I think this this goes to continue your curiosity around how ratings can go down. And so new information is submitted and highlighted. So if I put something in there and didn't highlight it, would it not have been reviewed? We asked um, review team members to read the entire amended application to ensure that they have the contextual understanding of the entire application. But technically, the highlighted portions is the areas that the sponsor wanted the review team to know we have made these changes. Okay, so the instruction to the review team on a resubmitted application is to start the process all over and review it holistically. Yes. Okay. So regardless of whether I'd highlighted it or not, because we keep calling out highlighted information. So regardless of whether I'd highlighted it, it still would have been taken into consideration. Correct. Okay. So I'm just concerned. I'm, I'm just curious why we keep calling out that it was something that was highlighted. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Bugs. One thing of note, more from our board and to, I guess, Dr. Roby and Dr. Battle, is that while 
Invictus and the other two charter schools were up for evaluation, what was that, roughly a month ago, two months ago? April. Uh, the director of charter schools, the Tennessee, Tennessee Department of Education, reached out to us to talk about potentially uh, making edits to the process or making edits to the rubric, to the application, and then she was mysteriously let go. I think it's interesting, and I believe that as a board, I've already spoken to a couple members of the Davidson County delegation at the state legislature, and I believe it's time for us to call on them. Kayla Pammer, really, bro? Kayla Pammer is the, um, the, the, the whip, the Davidson County whip, and so I think it's, it would behoove us, I think we've already missed their July meeting, but I believe it would behoove us to go ahead and talk to them and mention the idea that even with a new commissioner, that we would like to have more oversight of the Department of, there, we want them to oversee the Department of Education a bit better because that likely did hurt Invictus, but it certainly did not help us as a board to make better decisions either because we should be able to offer changes and edits to this rubric and to this process before it's just dropped. So to the point of Invictus Charter School, it might very well have been that in the middle of this Department of Education professional shifting and changing and adjusting the application that something was lost in translation. I don't mean to speak for her, but I've spoken to her since she was released, or she, since she transitioned, and it's just interesting how how that all shook out. Something something for us to consider as we develop policy, and certainly as we develop an advocacy plan for this year. Thank you. I know that we've had uh, concerns, myself included, with the rubric for years. Uh, as the rubric is created outside of us and it's TDOE. So we are held to something that we really don't have much say in on how it is used uh, besides our own staff that have to use it um, and give their time to be a part of the review committee. So I know the rubric has been an ongoing conversation and series of consternation for lots of people. Um, in the pathway of what I did before, um, I know Dr. Nabak McKinney, you are going to speak here in a second, but because I'm going to try to follow, try to follow my same pathway, have you heard much from your district about this school? No, I have not. Okay. And then my second question is, is does this school's needs or what they're describing as what they have as a school, does that fit our strategic plan and what we need for reimagined? And then I guess the follow up to that is, are those seats necessary or needed in that district? Uh, Madam Chair, there'd be no to both of your questions. Thank you. All right, I know that you would like to go last and so please do so. Uh, thank you. Um, I also want to thank Dr. Jones. Um, I met with her a, a couple of months ago about the Invictus Charter School, and we had a pretty in-depth conversation um, about her start and her appreciation um, or, or, or her wanting to start the school and had some um, some, some meaningful conversations around it. Um, and, and I appreciate your effort and what you want to do related to the, the community um, and provide that. However, um, what gives me pause, um, I, I currently have, um, I have a nine-year-old currently in our Montessori school, um, our public Montessori school right there in District 4. It is a high-performing Montessori school um, that we have. As a matter of fact, we just, opened uh, enrollment, increased enrollment um, for the sh school uh, currently for the upcoming school year. And so we don't see a need for an additional Montessori school currently in our area. I also took the time, um, I did, Dr. Jones, read the application, both the first one and the second one, um, because I, I felt like you deserve that. Um, for me to take the time to read the application and read the amendments instead of just getting what we are presented um, in the office. And, and like Doc, uh, Ms. O'Hara Block, I'm going to make you a doctor, it's okay. <laughs> um, uh, there is some, some, for me, I would have loved to see a stronger de description around what Montessori education is. Since I am a parent of Montessori education, I really understand it and didn't see that in your application. Also, I didn't really see a strong definition of what that project-based learning would look like um, and the benefit of it for your middle school model. Um, 
The other thing is around also the demand and enrollment. As I mentioned before, we currently have a high performing uh, public Montessori option within District 4. Um, and I'm also concerned about the Im fiscal impact that it would have as well. And, and we had that conversation um, before about the fiscal impact with the transition of us going from BEP to the TISA formula, um, how our city is going to be impacted um, around uh, that fiscal impact is a major concern for me, as well as the focus on the work that we want to do with the current Current schools that we have, both public and charter within our schools across the district, I would like to see our funds continue to be invested in the current schools that we have currently. Um, and we've had that conversation. Also, um, there was some mention about population growth um, has decreased in the area, and that was a need to bring in. But as I look at population growth, um, uh, into our public schools, they've actually increased the number of schools who, I mean, uh, parents have increased the number of families who are participating in our schools in our district. Um, so that number has increased or remained the same across our district. Um, and then the other thing, and, 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 and this is something that has been very important, I, I just want to thank everyone who has, who, um, took the time to fill out those responses of all those emails that we received over the last couple of days. Um, but personally, I have not received um, any phone calls um, or, um, and, and I, I've talked to, I'm pretty active in District 4, and I talk to constituents about, about their, di the, uh, across the district, and I'm not seeing any awareness of Invictus coming to District 4, um, or their request or need for Invictus in District 4. Um, I appreciate, Mr. Williamson, um, your discussion of really um, focusing in on black and brown students and providing them optional opportunities. And I think, um, for me, uh, we do have an we, we do have a, a Montessori option already available in that district in in that particular district. Um, so it wouldn't um, it, it it wouldn't for me um, impact the decision to not support it at this time. Um, so I appreciate. Um, all the work that you are doing and those who are who are rallied around it, but at this point, I cannot um, I cannot vote to approve um, the uh, Invictus currently in District Four. We have a motion to excuse me. We have a motion to deny that's on the table. It's been first and seconded. All those in favor of denying this application, please raise your hand. All right. Those not in favor? We have one. And then we have no abstention. <coughs> Thank you. It gets us to our last one, please. We have reached our last New Star amended application. We will now review Nashville Collegiate Prep High School. Nashville Collegiate Prep High School is proposing a college preparatory focus for high school students. The grade span proposed is 9 through 12 with an enrollment cap of 600 students in the Cane Ridge cluster. This overview highlights a few of the original New Star application documented concerns from review team members presented to the board on April the 25th, 2023. The application included unrealistic enrollment goals. The policies and standards cited related to English learners were not compliant and current. There was insufficient funding for transportation for general and students with disabilities, numerous errors in the waivers, the plan did not include appropriate staffing for English language learners, the network declined to provide a network financial plan that outlines the fiscal health. And lastly, the data provided was either similar to or underperformed that of MNPS, as well as the application lacking a reporting of data for schools managed by the confirmed CMO Noble Education Initiative. In a review of the amended New Star application, the evidence findings are listed within the board report and are as follows. 
in academics, the applicant continues to reference outdated EL policies. Additionally, the attendance goal is 90%, which is below the district goal of 95%. The academic plan has several weaknesses related to ready graduate, new computer science requirement, as well as the GPA calculations. And lastly, the application still does not provide evidence of community support. In operations, the application still does not address areas of deficiencies related to professional development, transportation, staffing, and facilities within the budget. Additionally, there are numerous errors in the waiver submitted causing concerns for allowability for approval. And the applicant still does not provide a contingency plan if the high school construction is not completed on time. In financials, the application did not include an EL teacher in the budget and the applicant still does not provide a required network plan. In portfolio review and performance record, the authorizer annual report from the Tennessee Charter Commission for school year 21-22 indicated that the middle school under their LEA did not meet the standard in the category of academics and the level of performance of the existing middle school is either similar to or underperforms that of MMPS. TCA 49-13-108C states that an LEA may deny on the basis that the opening of the charter school will cause a substantial negative fiscal impact on the district. MMPS utilizes the number of projected students for the proposed charter school and the difference between the estimated per pupil amount for the charter school and the average student base budgeted per pupil amount for traditional schools. The following chart indicates the negative fiscal impact for years one through capacity for Nashville Collegiate Prep High School. I will highlight years one and year capacity negative fiscal impact to MMPS. In year one, with an enrollment target of 150 students, the negative fiscal impact to MMPS would be 1,185,000. And at capacity with 600 students, the negative fiscal impact would be $4,740,000. The review team determined the following ratings for Nashville Collegiate Prep High School. For academic plan design and capacity, partially meets the standard. For operations plan and capacity, partially meets the standard. For financial plan and capacity, does not meet the standard. And for portfolio review performance record, partially meets the standard. I will turn it over to the board for the discussion and vote for the New Start amended application for Nashville Collegiate Prep High School. Thank you. I'll entertain a motion. I move to deny the application of Nashville Collegiate Prep High School based on findings of the Charter Review Board. I'd ask if there are any specific concerns that the board may have. Including but not own. limited to the negative fiscal impact on uh, the student-based budgeting formula that MNPS uses, the lack of community support, the does not meet standard uh, performance based on the Tennessee Charter Commission and a level of performance that un, a level of performance lower than that of MNPS in the middle school. That's a proper motion. Do we have a second? Period. Second. All right, it's been first and seconded. Do we have any discussion or comment? I will say the only thing that I find interesting is that the portfolio review, the idea that the Charter Commission, with its loose standards, said that this does not meet the standard in the category of academic performance, would in my mind mean that the review team should have also denoted it as does not meet standards, but that's the only thing I can note to even say. So I will not be voting for this. Got it. Anyone else? Uh, this school is in a shared district of really Cheryl, who is on vacation, and myself. 
Um, so I will be answering my own questions that I've been asking. Uh, I have not heard from anybody within the district and nor has Cheryl to my knowledge about wanting this additional high school grades. In fact, the only times I ever hear about National Collegiate Prep are frankly not positive conversations with constituents that are trying to find who to speak to at that school about a concern or issue that they have. Um, and that's typically because of their relationship with NEI. That goes along with, um, I know personally, because it's been asked, I've been asked to share this information, that the um, council member for the, our district, or one of our, we have many shared council members, um, has been concerned about them being able to build this high school without the approvals. And so, of course, that high school is already almost built. In the Cambridge area, um, through an R2 zoning, that has a small caveat where they were allowed to go ahead and start building this without the approvals. The area surrounding it's very upset that they have started this and have committed to building the school without any community input. The council member has asked repeatedly for meetings with this school and with NEI or with anybody that would be willing to meet with them to kind of go over that to build some community goodwill, and that has been denied repeatedly. So um, those have been some concerns as of recent within the school. I, of course, have ongoing issues. Of course, we've talked about with um, the ELL issues, whether it's a lack of funding or appropriation of teachers or transportation or anything along those lines, specifically considering the demographics that they serve within Cheryl and I's district. And um, the other question I have, which I cannot answer for myself, is does the school meet our strategic needs or are there, I can answer the second part, but are there seats needed in this area that the school could serve? Madam Chair, the answer to your question is no. Um, we have some really high options inside this area that already have seats available. So these seats are not needed. Um, and of course, the fiscal impact would be detrimental to not just, of course, my district or Cheryl's district, but the entire school system. So I, too, will be voting no against it. Anybody else? Yes, Ms. O'Hara Block. This is, it's not related to this specific vote, but I'm, I'm, I'm not sure when to bring it up. I just have a, a, a request around charter schools generally. Is it okay to comment on it now, or should I wait for a Can you wait till afterwards? Yeah. Okay. Anybody else on this specific vote? All right, seeing none, we have a motion to deny that's been first and seconded. All those in favor of denying, please raise your hand. That is unanimous. Thank you so much. Real quickly before we get to, oh, is there anything else we need to offer? Okay. Thank you, Sharika. Thank you, Sh thank you Sharika. Um, is there, do you want to make your comment now or would you like to make it? Yeah, it's just quickly, I, I know we're talking about retreat and we're talking about times to have various discussions. One thing I'd really like to see in a conversation is around um, actually, uh, to uh, one of the questions that you re were repeatedly asking, which is um, in a particular area across um, schools or across the, the uh, district, if we're thinking about MMPS reimagined, what is or is not the role for charter schools in, in, that, uh, in that plan or in how we think about it? It is part of our um, charter uh, policy that we reaffirmed or made a couple changes to earlier tonight that we think about the plan as a whole for the district and so I would like to have us um, have that conversation and the other thing I'd really love to have be part of that is something I raised during um, the initial discussion of these applications which is the fiscal impact um, of approving or denying charter schools uh, hits us regardless, and, and I, I would love to be thinking about uh, if we approve it, what's the fiscal impact? If we deny it but it gets approved anyway, what's the fiscal impact? And there's some element of that um, that I'd like to see as part of a conversation more broadly around, uh, around charters and the impact of charters on the district. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right, so that brings us to board committee reports. We've had uh, only one board committee that, that was this uh, afternoon, excuse me, at four o'clock. So first I'll let Ms. Masters go over that and then uh, we will hear from Dr. Nabod McKinney about the AVID training. All right, thank you. So yeah, we had a governance committee meeting at four o'clock 
and we went over a pretty lengthy slate of um, policies, all but one of them um, related directly to new or adjusted state law. And I would definitely recommend anyone who's interested to watch the video of that conversation. I was appreciated everyone's participation on the board. We had some good discussions around that. Um, and that those were all of the recommendations were um, to pass those policies, and then that was passed as a part of the consent agenda. Perfect. Thank you so much. Our avid training, please. Um, I don't know which board committee that falls under, but um, Chair Elrod and I were able to attend um, the AVID uh, conference um, or the Summer Training Institute that was hosted in Orlando, for Florida with more than 600 of our Metro employees um, from central office staff all the way down to support staff, right? Mm -hmm. um, across the district who are looking to implement AVID um, across their schools. Um, if you are not familiar with AVID, it is advancement via individual determination. It is a program that really works to um, make sure that every student is known by providing individual support to students um, throughout their academic um, throughout their academic times um, in grade levels and across each tier um, as they continue to move. Um, it was, I don't know, it was an amazing event. I'm really impressed by the level of dedication um, and excitement that our teachers and our uh, principals and our senior level staff, everyone was really excited um, about the program, about getting, um, about re uh, being ready to implement it um, in the upcoming school year and to take the knowledge and resources that they have. Um, I really, really appreciate that we said that we are doing a district-wide initiative and we put our money where our mouth is to be able to support that and I'm glad that we were able to do that as well to be able to support as many um, educators um, and leaders as possible as, as we could. Um, for those um, that don't know, I did AVID as a teacher in Metro Nashville Public Schools back in the day, because I'm only 25, y'all remember that. Um, but back in the day we did AVID, it was an amazing program and I am uh, absolutely excited to see us do this district-wide initiative. Um, and we did a lot of recruiting. And when I say um, this is one example of when we leave Nashville and people are trying to do what we do, this is an example for us to have central off our director of schools, central level, central office staff, as well as principals, teachers, support staff across the district come together. Um, other districts who were participating in the AVID conference were amazed. They never had principals in some cases. They never had uh, uh, central office staff participate. They've never had their director of schools to participate. And, and having board members there was a game changer. Um, and so at that point, I think Rachel Ann and I were recruiting people to move to Nashville because, you know, we always need teaching and leadership positions. Um, and so um, it's just I'm excited about the impact that it's going to have for this year. So, again, thank you for your visionary leadership and the work that you are doing with your team to really spread the vision of making and, and, and finding programs, really not programs, movements, changes in movements um, to make sure that every student is known. This is a game changer and I really appreciate it. So I do one other thing want to um, for the director evaluation committee, I do want to say that Dr. Battle's fourth quarter is in, review is in. Please make sure that you are reviewing that, providing feedback and um, comments to Dr. Battle. It is due August 3rd. Mm -hmm. Ms. Block, yes, and thank you, Ms. Block, for sending that out. Um, it is due August 3rd. There are some incentives um, and goodies um, on whoever is the first, but I'm going to be the first um, this time. <laughs> this time. <laughs> Who was the first last time? You. You. <laughs>
deadline for treats? It's exactly um, the second. August 2nd, yes. So we let's make sure that. And it's just the first three people. You know what? So it's really August 3rd, and so. <laughs> Yeah, so make sure that y'all get that in. Take the time to be uh, to do the review, um, and we will um, have a director's evaluation committee meeting on the next board meeting, which is August the 8th. Thank you. Thank you. That gets us to um, board announcements. So District 1, do we have anything? So I'm going to uh, start off with uh, just some comments about our, our discussion, and one, the first one is just a recommendation, because it just feels a little weird to me. If we can just find a way to move committee reports before the things that we're voting on that was a result of the committee report, <laughs> just move that up above the, right before the consent agenda, that would make a little bit more sense. I think it contextualizes it better for the public that's paying attention. Um, then uh, to uh, Ms. O'Hara Brock's comment about the role, you know, in a retreat discussing the role that charters play. You know, that is the foundation of my frustration with charters. Let's put fiscal impact to the side. Let's put the, you know, um, for me, understanding how charters have drained District 1 schools, resulting in the need to close several schools and, and the backlash that, um, you know, we dealt with um, as a result of that. If we were able, and I think this goes to Ms. Buck's comment and recommendation about this meeting, I think this meeting needs to be requested by the board as a whole. I don't think one-off conversations and, and this is not an advocacy thing. I think this is a collaboration thing. And if the state wants to be serious about this district leveraging, if they want to be true to their lip service and their narrative about why charters exist, we need to have a conversation that talks more intentionally about a charter's role in supporting the district's desired outcomes for the students of Nashville. And so aside from that happening, it's never going to be what the narrative says is the purpose and the role of charter schools. If we can't get there, if we can't get to the point where that partnership is not expected to happen once a charter school comes to be within your district um, amidst a lot of angst and negative conversation, right? Because of the three we've just said no to, there's a strong possibility that one's going to be a thing. And so how can I expect that charter operator to come to the table and then want to be a partner with someone that had no desire for their presence in the first place? And so it is, it's all of those things. It's the money, it's the relationship, it's the, it's the, the ability and the audacity to bring forth an application to me that undermines what I'm trying to accomplish for my students. I need students at 95% minimum of attendance, and you were like, ah, 90%, ah, whatever. They can come when they want to come. And so it has to be a bigger, again, higher level conversation for us to get to that point where there is such a thing as the role that charter schools play in the district in our meeting our goals. Um, yeah, so those are just the comments I wanted to make and just looking forward to the start of this school year more than ever. <laughs> More than ever. More than ever. Uh, so super, super excited uh, about it. Again, thanks again. I'm super excited about the new principals at our schools uh, across the district and looking forward to conversations with them to see how we can help them move the needle. Super excited. Yep. This is like the no. best year ever. Yeah. District 3. <laughs> Thank you. I just want to say like that I... I appreciate what Dr. Gentry is saying about charters because I think it is, um, it's a little bit, bit backwards to come up with a plan for a charter based on um, having this feeling that MMPS is, is failing children. Yeah. And when the idea around choice is based in that, rather than in the desire to fit in with a strategic plan that is being implemented with a lot of thoughtfulness, with a lot of success, I, I think that that is where the issue comes into play. Do you really want to be a part of MMPS? You know, when you're coming to us and saying, I want to be an authorized charter school in Metro Nashville Public Schools, you're saying you want to be a part of Metro Nashville Public Schools. 
I mean, if what you really want is for us to just say no so you can go and be authorized by the state, okie dokie. But, like, we, we have plans in place that you could, you know, look at and think about where you could fit in with that. So, also, it's just not about just a cool idea. And also, public education, I appreciate all the choice we have in MMPS. I have a child who graduated from NSA. Um, but, I mean, at the core of it, it is about what you need, not what you want. Like, there's choice, and there's allowing all children to thrive, and then there's taking choice into this realm of every little thing that every single person desires. So, and as my husband says, you can want in one hand and poop in the other one and see which one fills up faster. Okay. Just saying. There's that. <laughs> There's that. There's that. Okay. Um, okay. Just moving on from that. Um, also wanted to remind everyone to please vote. Election day, August 3rd. It's highly likely we will have a runoff on September 14th. So um, mark your calendars for that as well. Um, the outcome of this election, I mean, the outcome of local elections is so important to our daily lives. And the outcome of, um, of this election is going to have a big impact on how we are able to govern our, our school system moving forward and how we're able to fund our school system moving forward as we continue. We need to depend on our city to give us the funding um, that we need in order to, to fully educate our children. So be sure you do that voting. Um, also wanted to say that the Stratford Cluster Back to School Bash is this Saturday from 10 a.m. to noon at the Stratford High School baseball field. Um, be there or be square. It's going to be awesome. All of the cluster schools will be there. I'm very excited um, to say that I will be there, and I can't wait to meet everyone. I um, also want to mention that District 3 didn't have any new principals. I mean, I guess we're just, like, retaining people like crazy in District 3. They love it there. Just saying. Girl. I mean, I love new principals, too, but, like, you know. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Ooh, yeah. tomato, tomato, so, <laughs> um, Ceremonial ribbon cutting for, for the new Goodlessville Elementary School, August 7th at 1 p.m. The school is amazing, beautiful. I want to give a shout out to District 10 um, Counselor Zach Young for all of the work that he put in and to Mayor Cooper for funding this. It's going to be um, just such a wonderful thing for the Goodlettsville community. I'm very excited about that ribbon-cutting event. Um, yeah, I think that's all I have to say. Thanks. <coughs> District 4. Hi, I just have a couple of announcements. Um, want to invite everyone back uh, to the Back to School Bash that we will be hosting in the McGavick Cluster. Um, this will be our first Back to School Bash, so we're really excited to host this first one and be able to build on top of it um, every year. It will be hosted on August the 5th from 10 to 2 at the Hermitage Community Center. If you're not familiar with Hermitage Community Center, it's right next to the Hermitage Library and the Hermitage Police Department. And so in that little trio. So we're really excited about this and excited about the opportunity to really serve students in our community. Um, if you would like to be a sponsor or, or a vendor, please reach out. Um, the information is on our website, um, and we look forward to working with you. Um, I will be starting, August is around the horizon, <laughs> close. Um, so I will be starting back with coffee um, and conversations um, over in my district. Um, those dates will be forthcoming, so be on the lookout on my website so that you can see um, when those dates will be. But the first one will be... Um, I think we're focusing on, uh, I'm focusing in on the third Thursday of every month. Um, and so I will post those dates so you have it. I also want to personally welcome, um, and, and I'm excited about our new principals in District 4 um, at Pennington Elementary, McGavick High School, Two Rivers Middle, and Andrew Jackson Elementary. Congratulations to the principals. They've already hit the ground running. They are also already doing amazing things, and I look forward to a spectacular school year um, with them. Um, that's it. Oh, please, please, please get out and vote. Um, this is a major election. 
Um, we have a mayor, if you guys don't know, around education funding. Um, this, who we have in Metro Council and who we have as the mayor makes a difference. We want to make sure that we are continuing the major investments that we have had for Metro Nashville Public Schools. So make sure you are looking, um, doing your research on the candidates um, and supporting the candidates who will help support you and your families as they attend Metro Nashville Public Schools. So please get out to vote. Early voting ends on Saturday. Yes. All right. Thank you. District 5. Thank you, Veer. Sorry. No, fish bash. Thank you very, very much. Um, first, I would like to say that Di uh, Chair Elrod, you appointed me to the Metro Parks Board, and I'll try to be more thoughtful in August about letting you all know what's coming down the pike. There is a large investment from the city and from a private partnership moving into golf. They're updating some parks around the city, and I think the more that they have tried to convey to the Parks Board that this is to... Um, increase diversity, inclusivity, and to train young people, I'll try to make sure that I have some dates and information to share with the community about how they can get involved and benefit from this, these large investments. Um, I also want to take a point of privilege and to give a shout out to Dr. Kelby House Gardner. She is one of my NEOs. She's a member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. I met her at, at Tennessee State University. I'm sorry, at the two-time Grammy Award-winning Tennessee State University, and I'm just so excited to see her return to her um, her alma mater to become the principal. She's just a phenomenal leader, a, a phenomenal uh, colleague. And so congratulations, Dr. Gardner. I also want to thank and congratulate the different the 32 different principals that I have. I believe I have four new ones, and I will be reaching out to you all. Congratulations. Welcome to District 5. Um, I also want to uh, make you aware that on August 4th, Jones Elementary will be having their Meet the Teachers Back to School party, block party from 3 o'clock to 4 o'clock, I'm sorry, 3 o'clock to 5 o'clock, and then on Saturday, we'll be at Napier with the Creative Girls Rock, another member of uh, Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated um, is leading that work, but we'll be there for the Creative Girls Rock back to school <laughs> bash. Haters gonna hate, man. <laughs> Haters gonna, and, I, and lastly, I, I really have enjoyed my time on this board, but I am beginning my 12-month countdown. <laughs> Baby, August 2024. We appreciate your dedication to the board, even in your last 12 months, even bringing Christopher with us. District 6. Well, she was still saying Christopher. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> All right, District 6. Do you have anything? I'm 7. I'm sorry. You are. <laughs> 6 is gone. 7. So sorry. I'm like, Cheryl's not here. You're 7. So sorry. Oh, yeah. She has something. Yes, for District 6, she wanted me to announce the Creative Girls Rock Back to School Festival at Southeast Community Center. Um, it will also be on August the 5th, but it starts at 2. So you can come to my event um, at 10 and then go to her event at 2. <laughs> huh? The Creative Girls Rock? Is it at Napier? I could be we'll, we'll confirm. We'll, we'll confirm. confirm. I apologize. All right. Thank you for sharing that. I'm so sorry, I got them confused. I think they have one pub in there. It's good work. Mm -hmm. So sorry. District 7. <laughs> okay. Um, we're kind of playing on uh, school board member uh, Block and Gentry's point um, about having a relationship with charters. I mean, I have personally reached out to charters that even um, have not been approved and went on to be approved by the state and try to have an open line of communication. So with Pathways, if that happens, I still extend that invitation out to you that we need to have a collaborative, at least open line of communication of how we work within the district um, with that. And I think that's very important as we talk about the evolution of education over the next decades and years about what does that look like and how to have a partnership and take away some of the, the politics and the rhetoric and get to the heart of why we are in education in the first place. So um, I just want to extend that um, 
send that out there. And then also we have a back to school bash, back to school bash. I'm listening to you guys much. Back to school giveaway for um, uh, J.E. Moss Elementary School. Um, thank you to the Urban League of Middle Tennessee and High Touch Business Services in partnership with Councilwoman Tanika Vercher and myself. Uh, we will give away backpacks and school supplies for free. It's only for uh, J.E. Moss students. So on August uh, 2nd at 5.30, um, come to front of the school and we will give um, wonderful supplies needed. So August 2nd, 5.30, um, backpacks and school supplies for um, J.E. Moss Elementary School. Thank you. Um, uh, most of the District 8 schools uh, are, in fact, I think all of them uh, that I received their news newsletters for are hosting various back to school events, et cetera. Um, it would take me a while to announce all of them here. So if you are a parent um, or a family member in any of those schools, please check out um, mostly, I think these are PTO websites, so go to uh, go to PTO websites um, for any of the Hillsborough Cluster schools and you can find out when all of those different events are happening. Also sign up for their newsletters. Um, I send information out through PTOs pretty frequently. Um, I also wanted to recommend, so compliment again, I, I think I talk about this particular app with a high level of frequency, um, but Infinite Campus Parent Portal, whatever we want to refer to it as, Student Dashboard, has all of the results from last year, um, TCAP results, uh, benchmark results, et cetera. So both parents and students, my kids actually went on there and found their scores before I even knew they were there um, and brought them to me. It's a great opportunity to go and review with your kids what happened last year, what your goals are for this year. Also. Um, the state does have a really fantastic um, TCAP portal as well. You need to have your state student ID in order to get that, which is available on Infinite Campus. Um, and so um, I recommend to all parents and students that um, take a look at those things before we get started in the new year and have your own goals for yourselves for the coming year. All right, District 9. Okay, um, I do, I'm very excited that we have a new principal coming in to District 9, although it's a little odd because I had MMPS Virtual School as one of my schools two years ago, and then we got redistricted and I lost it, and Dr. Gardner was amazing and we're sad to lose her. Um, but now they're coming back because Dr. Brenda Diaz will be the new principal at both Big Picture High School and MMPS Virtual School. So we're really excited about that. Um, Dr. B's amazing, y'all. She has won national awards. She has, she won MMPS Principal of the Year 2022-23. She's fabulous. So um, if you would like to meet her, because this is a virtual school, they will be holding a virtual meeting. And that's going to happen tomorrow at 5 p.m. And there is a QR code to access that Teams meeting. And I've already shared it on all my social social media pages, um, and they also have it on the MMPS virtual school page as well. So um, if you're interested in learning more about um, Dr. Brenda Diaz, I suggest you join us. And finally, I am extremely excited to say that there will be a community open house for everybody to come, whether or not you're in the district, and tour our brand new high school, James Lawson High School. So we are so excited because it is state of the art. It is beautiful. Please come out and see us. It will be taking place this Saturday from 10 a.m. to noon. There are going to be tours around the building that will be led by our current students for Lawson High School. There will be family activities available and um, we will have many teachers, principal, all of us are gonna be there and we're really, really excited to show off all this everything we've been working for. So I um, want to make sure that we're thanking Mayor Cooper for being part of this and being willing to fund it, making sure that I shout out our council members, um, Dave Rosenberg, who was really instrumental in this, and um, Sherry Weiner before she rolled off, was really instrumental in making sure that this was going to happen. And of course, shout out to the previous District 9 board member, Amy Frog, because she also helped kind of push this across the finish line. So I'm just really excited to share 
share this, and I really hope that um, we can all rally around this new school and that we make it a true community school. All right, thanks. Thank you. We have a number of big events coming up, as you have heard through the number of back to school bashes. It includes one that was uh, passed along to me at Napier, but it's open to all of Greater Nashville. It's a back to school event on the 5th, August the 5th, from 12 to 4, and it's being hosted by Creative Girls Rock and Creative Kids Rock. It includes free backpacks and school supplies as well. Um, for us as a school board, I want to remind us that we have summer graduations that happen on the 28th. They're at 10 a.m. and at 2 p.m., so y'all are welcome to be there. And then, of course, we have Together for Teachers, which was mentioned in our director's report, which is on the 31st. And I would love it if we could have a good presence there as board members to kind of start off and kick off the school year for that. Um, please don't forget, I know we've had a lot of discussions about the importance of voting, and I echo those things, particularly as our funding is 70% from our city and 30% from our state, which is flip-flopped from every other school district. So it's important for who is inside of city um, uh, positions of power. But I want to remind us that it is likely to have a runoff, and we have prepared for that, just in case you're listening as a family. And that runoff date and election date September 14th, and students uh, already do not report on that day to school, just in case that is a concern. I've had that already been asked a couple times. So um, other than that, would there be no further? Oh, yes. Hold on. Dr. Battle has something to say. And I try not to be the last word as should come from um, from our board leadership. But I do want to just give a um, kudos, a shout out to our community partners who have stepped up big when it comes to back to school supplies and uh, materials for our young people. This is something that for years as a district, we were just trying to figure it out. And so um, it is a great grand commitment um, on behalf of the community to really step up and fill um, this gap. So we see you, we appreciate you, we're going to try to get to as many as we can um, to champion your work, but um, I just didn't want to take the opportunity to miss the moment because this is like a space that communities across the country love to be in to have the community step up um, and fill um, the gaps and quite frankly just supporting all of our students regardless of the schools um, that they serve. So thank Thank you, thank you, thank you. And if there's anyone else who wants to partner, if you need um, additional assistance or support from us as a district, please let us know. And we look forward to um, partying and celebrating um, and just really um, bringing in the new year on a high note with making sure our families and students have what they need. So thank you. It is a nice problem to have that the announcements take a long time because we have so much involvement. We will absolutely take that where we're overwhelmed at the amount of things on our calendar because the community wants to be involved in our students and schools so much. We'll, we'll take that any day. Be there no further business. This meeting is adjourned. Has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again or for more information on this and other programs, visit Nashville.gov.